We'll be talking about closure properties of context-free languages. In fact, last time we said that uh, context-free languages are closed under what? Union, concatenation, and star. <coughs> and let's revisit this. We talked about this quickly. So in fact, showing that context-free languages are closed under these uh, regular operations, union, concatenation, star, uh, is going to be easier than showing uh, that uh, regular languages are closed under these operations. Uh, so if we are given two grammars for two languages, grammar one, which is a set of variables, let's use the same <coughs> terminals, and then a set of productions, and then a start variable S1, and grammar two with another set of variables, uh, same set of terminals, a distinct set of productions, P2, and a start variable, S2. Now, V1 and V2 must be what? Distinct. Now, if they are not distinct, or two, two separate sets, yeah, distinct sets, if they are not, you can easily make them distinct, right? You can rename them. So, for example, you can just add a subs subscript 1 to every variable in the set of variables for uh, G1, and then you can add the subscript 2 to every variable in uh, the set of variables for G2. So, you can easily rename the variables such that they are uh, distinct, if they are not already distinct. So we can assume, safely assume that they are distinct. Now we can easily construct a grammar for the union. So we can construct a context-free grammar, a grammar G for the union, or for the union I mean L of G1, union, L of G2. Again, what does this notation L of G1 mean? Language. Language of grammar G1, and this is the language of grammar G2. So we union languages. It doesn't make sense to say grammar 1, union, grammar 2. There is no such thing. The union is an operation that applies to languages, not to grammars. But we are going to construct a grammar G for the union, and G is going to be V T P and uh, S. Now, what should V be? What's the relation between V and V1 and V2? What's the relation between V and V1 and V2? It's the union. So you just add them up. V1 union V2. Is that all? No. V equals V1 union V2. Union what? S. We have added S. And the set of terminals is the same. Now P is going to be what? P1, union P2, union what? What do we add? Okay, so let's take an example. So let's take uh, L1 equals a n b n n greater than or equal to zero and l2 equals b n a n such that n is greater than or equal to zero 
So now a grammar for L1 is S1, A, S1, B, or Epsilon. A grammar for L2, S2 equals what? B, S2, A, or Epsilon. So we have two languages. Each language has a grammar. So this is S1, sorry. So S1 is A, S1, B, S2, B, S2, B. Now, I can construct a grammar for the union where S equals what? S1 or S2. And these remain the same. S1 and S2 remain the same. So this is a grammar for the union where S1 and S2 remain the same. So what did I do here? My set of variables, I introduced a new variable S. So that's why my set of variables is V1 union, V2 union S. And I introduced a new production. So P1 union P2 union S goes to or S expands to S1 union S2. So this is a grammar for the union. So in this case, you know, what's the language? The language is the strings that, are, that have either uh, a certain number of A's followed by the same number of B's or a certain number of B's followed by the same number of A's. So this is a string that belongs to L1. This is a string that belongs to L2. And the union means that you just add all the strings. So a string belongs to the union if it belongs to one of the languages that we are uniting. Okay. Uh, so this is the union. Concatenation. We can construct a grammar for the concatenation. L of G1 concatenated with L of G2, where G is V, T, P, S. Uh, this is going to be the same, except that, you know, the rule that we add for the concatenation is going to be what? How do we concatenate two languages? If you have two grammars, so here, I have a grammar for language one, grammar for language two. How do I construct a grammar for the concatenation? The concatenation is a string that comes from L1 followed by a string that comes from L2. So it's very straightforward. S is just S1, S2. This gives you a string that starts, you know, that has an, an, uh, a certain number of A's followed by a certain number of B's, followed by, uh, you know, a number of B's. So this is the this is where they get concatenated. Okay, so now just S is S one S two. Now what about the star? So we can construct a grammar for the star. or L1 star. So in this case, uh, how can we construct a grammar for L1 star? Star is repeating this. So we can just say S is, how do we repeat S1 as many times as we want? So S is S1, S or Epsilon. So this is, okay, S is, uh, so let's re repeat this. So S is S1S, and then I can do S1S again. Now this S1 is AS1B. And I can do AS1B again, and then Epsilon. 
And this is again S1, S. I can substitute epsilon for this. And then this S is A, S1, B. And I can substitute epsilon. So what's the string that we generate here? We generate A, A, B, B, then A, B. So we are repeating twice. So this is the first one, and this is the second one. So starring is repeating, selecting a string, string from the language and repeating that as many times as you want. So here we are repeating twice. Okay, so this is the star of this language. So in this case, what's V? V, v equals V1, union what? Union S. And then, the set of productions, P equals P1 union what? this production that we have added. S is S1, S or Epsilon. Okay? So now we have easily shown that in a straightforward manner, if we have two grammars for two languages, we can easily construct a grammar for the union by adding S is S1 or S2, and we can easily construct a grammar for the concatenation by adding S1, S2, and we can easily construct a grammar for the star of a language by doing this, repeating uh, an, uh, any number of times, including zero times. So this proves that uh, context-free languages are closed under union concatenation and intersection. Now, the point is that context-free languages are not closed under intersection. So, context-free languages are not closed under intersection. Now, we will show this by assuming that, by using a language that is known to be non-context-free grammar. So the language L equals A N, B N, C N, N is greater than or equal to zero is known to be non-context-free. So we did not prove this. We can, there is a pumping lemma for context-free languages that allows us to prove that a, a certain language is not context-free. But last time I gave an intuitive uh, explanation uh, why this language is not context-free or why we cannot uh, construct a context-free grammar for this language. And what was that intuitive uh, explanation? So, so we said, okay, A and B and cannot, we cannot do A and B and with finite automata because a finite automaton cannot count two things, cannot count the A's and the B's and check that the number of A's is equal to the number of B's. A finite automaton cannot do that, but a grammar can do that because of this. You know, this is a grammar can, that can count A's and B's that will ensure that the number of A's and the number of B's is the same. But a grammar cannot count, a context-free grammar cannot count three different things. It cannot count A's, B's, and C's 
and ensure that the number of A's is equal to the number of B's is equal to the number of C's. So that's the intuitive explanation. And to convince yourself, you can try to come up with a context-free grammar that generates this language, and you will not find one. Now, we will assume this language is known to be context-free, non-context-free, and this can be easily used to show that context-free languages are not closed under intersection. So if, if you are given a language that is known to be non-context-free, how do you think you can prove, ca can use this language, or the, the, can use this known non-context-free language to prove that context-free languages are not closed under intersection. What do you think we need to come up with? We need to come up with two context-free languages whose intersection is this language. So we need to come up with L1 and L2 such that both L1 and L2 are context-free and their intersection is L. So can you come up with two languages that are context-free but their and their intersection is this? Okay, I can give you the first language. So the first language is A N B N C M such that N is greater than or equal to zero and M is greater than or equal to zero. So L1 is context-free. L1 is context-free because we can easily construct a grammar for it. Okay, give me a grammar for L1. S is well, we can easily divide it into two pieces. So this is S1 and this is S2. So S is S1 and S2 and then we can write a rule for S1 and the rule for S2 and we know how to do S1 equal number of A's and B's and S2 is a very simple language it just generates any number of C's so S1 is going to be what? A, S1, B or Epsilon and S2 is going to be what? any number of C's C, S, 2, or Epsilon. So this generates any number of C's. This generates an equal number of A's and B's with the B's following the A's, or a, a certain number of A's followed by the exact same number of B's. So this is the, this language. Now give me another language that if intersected with L1 will give us a language that is known to be non-context free. So now it should be easy. Now it should be easy. Give me a language that if intersected with this, it's going to give this. Yeah. Is A, N, B, B, M, C, B, M? Okay, A, N. And B, B, M, C, M. Yeah, exactly. C, M. Such that N is greater than or equal to zero and M is greater than or equal to zero. So L2 is context free context, not computer science, context <laughs> free. Okay. L2 is context free and the grammar can be done in a similar manner. S is S1, S2, where S1 in this case is what? Any number of A. So this is our S1. By the way, in constructing grammars, you should be able to uh, you know, analyze a language into multiple languages. This, is, this, can, this can be a powerful technique in uh, designing grammars for languages. This, uh, you know, ability of analyzing a language into multiple languages. So here you have two. So this is the concatenation of two languages. The first language is just any number of A's. And the second language is an equal number of B's and C's but in order. So this is going to be 
uh, S1 is any number of A's, A, S1, or star, and S2 is B, S2, C, or epsilon. Now, clearly L1 and L2 are context-free, and their intersection is L. So, L1 and L2 are context-free, and L equals L1 intersected with L2. So, does anyone have a doubt about this intersection? That, you know, if you intersect this with this, if you intersect L1 with L2, you will get L. So, which has more strings? L1 or L? L1 has more strings. So, you know, here's a string. A, B, C, C. So, this string belongs to L1, but it does not belong to L. So here is at least one string that belongs to L1 but does not belong to L. So L1 has more strings than L. So it has all the strings where the number of A's and the number of B's are equal. And L2 has all the strings in which the number of B's and the number of C's are equal. So in order to belong to L1, you have to have the same number of A's and B's. In order to belong to L2, you'll have to have the same number of B's and C's. In order to belong to the intersection, you'll have to have the same number of A's and B's and the same number of B's and C's, which means you have to have the same number of A's, B's, and C's. Right? So, a string that belongs to L1 has an equal number of A's and B's and a string that belongs to L2 has an equal number of B's and C's. Therefore, a string that belongs to L1 intersection L2 has an equal number of A's, B's, and C's. A's, B's, and C's. Okay, and we know that this, and L is known to be uh, non-context free, therefore, this is one counter example. One counter example is sufficient to show that uh, the uh, uh, context-free languages do not satisfy this property, are not closed under intersection. Okay? Uh, questions? Questions on this? Okay. Now, now what about complementation? What about complementation? Given what we have presented so far, do you think uh, context-free languages are closed under complementation or not? Okay, so the answer to this question is, how did we prove that regular languages are closed under intersection? So, who remembers how we proved that regular languages are closed under intersection? How did we prove that L1 intersection L2? So, what was the, the technique that we used to prove that regular languages are closed under intersection? We used De Morgan's law to show that L1 intersection L2 is the complement of L1 union the complement of L2. So this gives the complement. So this is the complement of the intersection is the complement of L1 union the complement of L2. 
But what about the complement of the complement of the intersection? That's the complement of this. So the complement of the complement is the intersection. So if in regular languages we argued that regular languages are closed under union and they are closed under, uh, under complementation, therefore they are closed under intersection. Now we know that context free are closed under union but not closed under intersection. So what does this imply about complementation? What does it imply about complementation? We're saying if, okay, if closed. So this is a logical statement. If closed under union and closed under uh, complementation then closed under intersection if closed under union and closed under complementation then closed under intersection now if it's not closed under intersection what does this imply It implies that it's that this is not true. So if if this is true, closed under union and closed under complementation, if this is true, it implies that this is true. Then closed under intersection. Now if this is true, this true implies this truth. Now what if we know that this is not true? What does it imply? It implies that this is not true. What do we call this? Yeah, this is the contrapositive. So the contrapositive tells us that if this is not true, then this is not true. So, and what's the negation of this? Closed under union and closed under complementation. The negation of this is either not closed under union or not closed under complementation. But we know that it's closed under union. Therefore, it cannot be closed under complementation. Okay, so do, do you see the argument? So the contrapositive here, contra, the contrapositive, not closed under intersection implies not closed implies the negation of this statement which is the negation of this statement is not closed under union or not closed under complementation but since we know that it's closed under union it cannot be closed under complementation since we know that context-free languages are not closed under, sorry, are, are closed under union, they cannot be closed under complementation. Or they must be must be, sorry, not closed under complementation. <coughs> complementation. Okay, so this is, so context-free languages are not closed under intersection and are not closed under complementation. 